A lot has been happening with AI in 2019. Let's get started. So what's changed? Faster specialized hardware, better machine learning algorithms, more, not just big data, but relevant data. And something that has really changed recently is money and money driven by results. For example, in July 22nd of this year, Microsoft invested a billion dollars in OpenAI to create an AI tech platform of unprecedented scale. What does that mean? They're recognizing that hardware and scale really matters for problem solving. And then, four days later, SoftBank announced a $108 billion AI vision fund. The scale of that is almost unbelievable. It's unprecedented in the AI world. And it's not just money driving things in AI today. The AI community is now charged up about making a dent in grand challenge problems like climate change. Here's an article that came out in June of this year with 22 authors from 13 top institutions all about tackling climate change with machine learning. And it's a substantive set of considerations. Look at this. Electricity, transportation, buildings and cities, industry, farms and forests, CO2 removal, climate prediction, societal impact, solar geoengineering, tools for individuals, tools for society, education, and finance. There are chapters in their report on each one of these things. It's not just a breezy report. So you can expect to see machine learning used to really impact climate change. Hardware has been a big driver lately. Here's the NVIDIA Tesla. Uh, the V100 processor has 21 billion transistors. And just yesterday, when we started this conference, a company called Cerebras announced a wafer scale engine that is 22 centimeters by 22 centimeters, 1.2 trillion transistors. It has 56 times the surface area of the NVIDIA Tesla chip. And if you are interested in empowering your teams with AI, I wouldn't recommend starting with chips and racks. I would recommend starting with the cloud, because that gives you access to scalable hardware and software frameworks that can greatly accelerate your problem solving. So here's Google Cloud's Anthos, which allows you to migrate your solutions from the Google Cloud to other cloud services as well, like AWS from Amazon or IBM Watson. So what we're seeing is that you can get started right away and not have the friction that's built into designing all of your own frameworks and your racks for computing. Things are now moving so fast that it's almost a blur where you need augmentation in order to resolve the speed of events. The competitive advantages from AI and machine learning are all of these. I'm not going to read them to you. The most important thing is expanding the range of the possible. What are these competitive advantages? You can reframe them as skills that you can take on yourself or that you can gift to your organization or your corporation. Expanding the range of the possible, doing things that you didn't know that you could do before. At Stanford, we've been looking at some decision metrics for improving decision making. Again, I'm not going to read these to you, but I'll just pull out one. Less error and bias. If you have the ability to identify what your assumptions are, you can test your assumptions. And that really matters. When your assumptions break, your problem solving breaks. All of you know that deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which is a subset of AI. Gary Marcus did a critique of deep learning. As successful as it is, it still has some weaknesses. And I'll just pull out a few of them. It's still data hungry. It's still shallow with limited ability to transfer into other skills, although there's been some success at that. 
It's not sufficiently transparent. You can translate that to it doesn't do explanation very well. And it cannot inherently distinguish between correlation and causation. And you may know that humans have some difficulty with that as well. One thing that Gary didn't identify in the set of weaknesses is this one. AI lacks empathy. Now, that doesn't matter too much when you're identifying cat videos, but it does matter in medicine. It does matter uh, when people are expecting empathy and they don't get it. So Dave Gunning at DARPA is running a program called XAI to improve explanation from machine learning. That really matters. He's working with 12 teams. They're getting some good results. Not all the results involve explanation using language. Sometimes the explanation is just pointing to a part of an image that has a problem, like a carotid artery. And we also know that machine learning can do descriptive analytics well, and it can do predictive analytics well, but prescriptive analytics deciding what should we make happen is still difficult. People can do this fairly well in an emergency or in an epidemic, but machine learning is not so good at this yet. So far, we haven't even come up to the bar, which is a pretty high bar, of a human five-year-old. In spite of that, machine learning can do some pretty amazing things. DeepMind's AlphaZero, which trains itself to do a variety of different tasks from scratch, has been able to master multiple games, chess, Japanese shogi, and Go. Check this out. Just with a couple of training steps on the order of 200,000, it can beat Stockfish, a champion chess player. It learned chess in eight hours. Shogi in about, again, 180,000 training steps. And AlphaGo, it surpassed Lee Sedol at about 100,000 training steps. And the world master, KGI, at 400,000 steps. DeepMind also created a system called AlphaStar, which beat two human pros at StarCraft II, an epically complex game that involves multiple iterations over time. And the people that were observing this competition had the following to say. AlphaStar split its stalkers into squads and flanked Nama's army on multiple sides. He was dumbfounded. What we saw there, that's not human. Well, they got that right. We are now driving our intelligence past just manipulating bits and information into manipulating atoms and molecules and matter and navigating complex terrain with robotics. Yesterday, you saw an example, an early example of the Atlas robot. I believe that was from 2016. Here's the Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics in 2018. Many of you have seen this with parkour. The evolution of this capability is really amazing. Very fast evolution. In the spirit of full disclosure, this Atlas robot sometimes crashed on this task and they cherry picked these. So I think it's important to understand where we actually are today. You get the idea. Science Robotics has been reporting on advances in robotics for the last three years. This particular issue was on robots for space and marine sciences. What's happening with marine sciences? We've got robots swimming underneath glaciers and using AI pattern recognition criteria to decide when to take a picture of melting glaciers. And when we send our robots to Mars, it's not just cool, we're doing real work there. This is the Curiosity robot that drilled a hole in the Gale crater and discovered an organic molecule there in June of 2018, thiophene C4H4S sulfur. An organic molecule, maybe it was not created by life, probably not, probably created by inorganic means, but still an amazing discovery on a planet far from our own. 
And here is a smaller robot. How small? 25 microns, 25 millionths of a meter per side of this triangular flap. It moves around on this platform by flapping its triangular sides. The platform that it's on is a cross-section of a human hair. In January of 2018, the Technical University of Munich published an article in Science on a self-assembled nanoscale robotic arm controlled by electric fields. What is that electric field control about? You've got this 25 nanometer DNA arm. It is amazingly small. Remember, a nanometer is a billionth of a meter. And you can pulse it in 360 degrees by positive and negative electromagnetic fields. It doesn't do a lot of work on its own, but when you gang them together, like actin myosin, you can get a lot of work done. Let's talk about some application areas. One of the most important applications of AI in 2019 is reinventing the way we invent. And an example of that is from InSilico, a pharmaceutical company that's using generative adversarial networks, generating drug candidates, and evaluating them using a discriminator to see if they come up to the bar of molecular properties that we're looking for. Philips Electronics has been monitoring instruments in the intensive care units for years now. Remember that the intensive care unit task for humans is very difficult. It's hours of boredom looking at screens, punctuated by moments of emergency and panic. And this is something that AIs do remarkably well, and humans do so-so. IEEE had an article recently about how IBM Watson overpromised and underdelivered on AI healthcare delivery. Well, that's not a surprise, and it doesn't mean that Watson is useless for healthcare. It just means that the task of cardiology or oncology or healthcare in general is much more complicated than Jeopardy. So IBM is continuing to develop Watson as they should but it's going to be a longer road than they anticipated. We now see collaborations of humans and machine learning platforms at Numeri, for example, a hedge fund that crowdsources their machine learning models to predict market behavior. They're doing remarkably well and paying their crowdsourced participants in cryptocurrency. And we found that there are many companies now, over 100, using machine learning for security, for cybersecurity, which is an unsolved problem and an evolving problem. It's like a predator-prey kind of problem. Darktrace has been building an enterprise immune system to identify threats with no signature, zero-day threats, that immune system is modeled after our own, which can deal with threats uh, in real time, threats that it hasn't seen before. I developed an AI applications framework after decades of doing real-world uh, AI work. I'm going to be running a workshop tomorrow. Uh, you're all welcome to come uh, about how to apply this framework to solving real-world problems. Uh, and I'm not going to read this to you. I think the most important thing to keep in mind is that if you're designing experiments at home, in your institutions or in your labs, make sure those experiments are real experiments. How do you know they're real? They actually can fail. You have to take some risk and realize that if they fail, you've actually learned something. So it's incredibly important to be able to make real progress, and you make real progress progress with experimentation. If you're interested in understanding the depth of different techniques in machine learning, you can go to Coursera, edX, Udacity, Udemy, Safari, Khan Academy, lynda.com, FastAI, all of them are viable places and here. And if you don't have the bench strength you need in AI, you can use Kaggle, which allows you to put up prize money and fund data science competitions. This has been remarkably successful. It's still open after it was bought by Google Cloud. 
or you can use Expertify. You don't have to put out your data. You can just put your problem out in public and people will bid on it, people who have been evaluated, uh, and you can uh, see how they do on a test problem for you. Let's talk about some ethical implications. People sometimes ask me, isn't it true that an autonomous vehicle killed a woman in Arizona? Doesn't mean, that mean that these robots are murdering robots and we should just get them off the road? No, it doesn't mean that. I did an editorial in Science Robotics in March of 2019 called Autonomous Vehicles, an Imperfect Path to Saving Millions of Lives. Yes, it's imperfect, it's still evolving, but humans are experts at killing other humans on the highway. We have murdered 1.3 million people globally every year. If that happened as a result of war, you'd have protests on every college campus. So we really need to keep things in perspective. Yes, it's bad for anybody to get hurt from an autonomous vehicle or otherwise, but it's very, very important to understand what we're dealing with. What we're dealing with is slaughter on the highways from humans and uh, the prospect of getting these numbers way down, less than 5% of where they are today, probably less than 1% eventually. Let's talk about AI safety and security. So uh, there's a lot of consideration of narrow or general uh, intelligence. I'll just point out to you that humans don't have perfect general intelligence either. Uh, and AIs like AlphaGo uh, and AlphaZero uh, are not completely narrow or general. They're somewhere in between. They're hybrid. And it's true that once AIs achieve AGI, and they haven't yet, maybe in 10 years, plus or minus five years, yes, there's some uncertainty around that, they're likely to improve very rapidly, given exponential advance, exponentially rapidly. And so uh, the good news is that we'll be integrated with them at some level of fidelity, and, uh, and it isn't uh, something that is just a surprise happening outside of our awareness. We're likely to be able to advance uh, in many different ways as they advance. But the challenge of superintelligence is less about evil and more about the alignment of objectives, a so-called alignment problem. The timing of that is uncertain. There's less agreement about that, but there should be some agreement about the need to be proactive about AI safety and security. To me, the near-term threat uh, of AI is people uh, using AIs uh, in ways that are careless or unethical, and I frame that as a security problem, very much like cybersecurity and a safety problem. And we have teams all over the world now focused on improving AI security and safety. And they're making real progress. And just keep in mind that the vast majority of people want to do good. It's a very small percentage that want to disrupt our civilization. There are some, and we need to be proactive about that, but not most. There was a summit that was sponsored by the New York Times uh, in January of 2019, and they looked at a bunch of issues, social issues, that are not typically discussed in AI conferences, accountability, complementarity between machines and people, regulation, collective governance, transparency, disclosure, privacy, diversity, and bias. These are all issues that are worthy of your consideration. If you're running projects in the real world and they impact people, you need to have this list in your back pocket. And you could take a look at their report. They explain each one of these areas in detail. You'll hear some other talks that go into this. The consequences for not paying attention to those social issues is you might find yourself called up in front of Congress uh, and being asked to answer a lot of uncomfortable questions like Mark Zuckerberg had to fairly recently. It isn't fun. It's important to keep in mind that AI is not going to result in utopia or oblivion. AI comes with trade-offs, and those trade-offs have to be managed faster, cheaper, 
better, different problem solving, and also job disruption in buying an election behavior modification and risk amplification and data bias. We really need to actively monitor these and manage them. So the Oxford School, uh, specifically Osborne and Fry, did a study a few years ago on vulnerability to machine learning for disruption of jobs, and they identified that the most routine jobs uh, can be fairly easily displaced by machine learning on the order of 47% of US jobs, and it's different in different locations. And when the World Bank took that analysis to other places around the globe, they identified places with much more uh, routine jobs like Ethiopia, China, and Thailand, others with much higher percentage of vulnerability. This is not built in stone. This is just a forecast, one of many possible, with different assumptions. The important take-home lesson here is that AI is going to impact human resources. Yes, it's going to augment people, but it will also simultaneously displace some people. And what matters is the ratio of new jobs. Will there be new jobs? You'll hear Ray and others and, and Neil saying, there'll be millions of new jobs, yes. But the question is, what's the ratio of new and displaced jobs, and what's the timing? And there's a lot of uncertainty about what that timing will be, and there's no guarantee, it isn't baked in, that the timing will be perfect. So a lot of people could get hurt, and we want to think about that proactively. We may have to adapt our jobs, the hours people work, and compensation. Keep in mind that the five-day workday uh, at one point was a radical idea. People used to work seven days, and many of us still do, but uh, it's, it's really amazing how the work week has changed, and it can change again if necessary. I also think we need to consider for those people who are somewhat recalcitrant to training, not everybody's going to come along for the ride. We need to think about basic income, different experiments in basic income. There's no one right way to do it, and there are lots of bad ways to do it. And free education. Free education is likely to be a win for everyone. So the future of AI conference that was held in Puerto Rico in 2015 identified four areas of R&D to decrease the probability of negative outcomes uh, with machine learning verification, validity, security, and control. Verification, making sure that you have a rigorous spec. Validity, making sure that the code matches the spec. Security, which is all about having multiple redundant layers of security. And control, even with the best of intentions and careful engineering, it's possible for systems to go off the rails, and we want multiple and redundant ways to reestablish control. In 2018, the Future of Life Institute ran another conference in Asilomar and came up with 21 principles uh, for managing AI. Google has already internalized their own principles, and here they are. Be socially beneficial, avoid creating or reinforcing unfair bias, be built and tested for safety, be accountable to people, incorporate privacy design principles, uphold high standards of scientific excellence, and be made available for uses that accord with these principles. They also stated that they wanted to stay away from military applications. So if you're interested, if you have a corporation or an organization that's interested in AI to benefit people and society, you can join the partnership on AI there are lots of robust companies that are members. This is a community that is concerned about getting good outcomes from AI. You'll also hear from the AI for Good folks. There are a lot of excellent initiatives moving forward along those lines. Some specific actions you might consider. Start with high-value problems, not technology, if you're starting new projects. Disrupt your own business or organization with AI and machine learning. Focus on what people and machines do best, not the same things. Utilize an AI applications framework. We'll be talking about that in the workshop tomorrow. 
use cloud-based AI platforms rather than start from a programming language like Python. If you're doing, for example, if you're doing research in AI, by all means, start with low-level languages. But if you just want to get good results, start at the highest level that you can specify your intent and do rigorous experiments. And if the framework is not serving your purposes, use a different framework or modify the one you're using. Design for security, ethics, and future generations. Remember, all of you have our future world and future generations in your hands. Thank you very much.